Hi, my name is Stephanie Paul, and I am a Training and Technical Assistance Associate with Virginia Commonwealth University Autism Center for Excellence. Today I'm going to present about social skills within the preschool curriculum. The title is Pre-K is More Than Just Play, Incorporating Social Skills Training for Preschoolers with ASD and Severe Learning Needs. Today's overview, the things that you are going to learn and what we hope to accomplish by this, by the end of this webcast are, what are social skills? What is social competence? Why are social skills important for preschoolers with ASD and severe learning needs? How to embed those social skills into the instruction of the preschool curriculum? How to incorporate explicit skill instruction as well as naturalistic-based instruction within the curriculum? and how to incorporate evidence-based practices to promote social competence in students with ASD and severe learning needs. Most preschools across the state typically are developmental in nature, um, but we want to make sure that we're capturing social skills instruction both explicitly and in a naturalistic way. So let's start off by looking at what are social skills and social competence. Social skills and social competence um, are often misunderstood and they involve a variety of different skills um, and are complex and multi-dimensional. What are social skills? Social skills are a set of important skills used to interact with others. Um, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about preschoolers. So what is developmentally appropriate as well? Obviously, uh, the social skills are going to be early building skills as opposed to more complex um, multidimensional skills. For preschools, they would include social reciprocation, social conversation, identifying and regulation of emotions, group rules and expectations, and play and leisure. We're going to go into these um, each in detail. but And this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but simply some of the main social skills um, that make students socially competent and that we would like to work on within the early preschool years. In the following video, you will notice um, two children, uh, both of them the age four, uh, that are having a social conversation. The teacher in the classroom is usually using that natural part of the routine of snack time and helping to facilitate a conversation. So this is a social conversation that you would see uh, among typical preschoolers. Oh, oh a house dater. Yeah, house dater. Mm, no house dater. Mm -hmm. where, do you, where is it? Where's your favorite fishing spot you're talking about? Oh, next to other cat. Oh, next to Isaac's house. Yay! Good job, Katie. Look at the house. It was my house. And there broke all my cat, and there went faster. I just bumped it in the head. You, uh, have, you have silly cats? Yeah. <laughs> I got or a jack. Okay. It bought all my stuff. But Kaden invited you to go fishing with him. Did you uh, hear him? Hey, Kaden, I got Princess Anna. And I'm Kaden. Did you eat the fish? I cut it. Yes, I wait. eat it. You eat I, it? Mm -hmm. you, you have it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you eat the fish you catch? Yeah, I mm -hmm. catch it. It was fun. It was fun. Who cooks it? Oh, uh, mommy. Mommy cooks it. And my tummy's um a breakfast. Oh. Yeah. Breakfast. I like cake. I got cake. And oh, after my cake, I don't have my cake. You're all trash bag. What? <laughs> Put the cake in the trash bag? <laughs> yeah. Really? All right. Don't forget to check your schedule so you know what you're doing. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's a nice conversation. Did you notice in the video the teacher facilitating? And you probably also noticed that the student, uh, the young lady, the girl on the right, 
she may have had some um, some parts of the conversation that didn't match up. The social reciprocation may not have always been there. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I wanted to help you notice that the teacher, the during the whole conversation, is helping to get the students back on track, prompt and cue them of where they're supposed to be, and what comes next in that social conversation. So what is social competence? Social competence is the ability to successfully engage in social interactions and relationships with others. This can be extremely complex, especially for young children who are just at those early stages of figuring out what social skills are and what social relationships are all about. Socially competent children are able to perform a, a variety of skills within different contexts. So they understand children's cues. It may be verbal and nonverbal. It may be um, reciprocation, the back and forth of uh, interactions and understanding um, those interactions and what to do next. Within socially, for socially comp children, uh, the emphasis is that relationship and back and forth, but also realizing that there are skills, prerequisite skills that a, st a student or a child needs to know in order to be socially competent. Um, let's look a little bit at the DSM-5 criteria and some information from the National Research Council on Educating Children with Autism. Um, in this diagnostic criteria for autism, uh, one of the main components are deficits in social communication and social interaction across mu multiple contexts. So in this uh, diagnostic cr criteria, you will see several references to the word social or social emotional. Uh, this particular uh, diagnostic criteria will talk about or share the range of students or children from the very socially aloof to those that lack eye contact um, to mildly socially awkward or inappropriate. Um, and so it shows the variety and the nature um, of those social uh, deficits in students. In 2001, the National Research Council Educating Children with Autism um, came up with what were the effective features for treatment models for students with ASD and severe learning needs. Um, again, you'll notice in the targeted domains of what we what should be worked on within those treatment models, you'll notice that social component. Um, and of course, within every effective treatment model prog or program, uh, there's the individuality of goals, um, incorporating evaluation, so ongoing data, both quantitative and qualitative, um, and then including, of course, families, guardians, um, and other professionals. The critical instruction strategies and supports uh, are based on applied behavior analysis. And we'll talk about those a little bit later in the presentation when we talk about evidence-based practices. They, uh, the effective treatment models should be delivered in structured environments. So this is not a haphazard way of teaching social skills. And we will uh, describe that when we get into explicit instruction and natural-based instruction and how to incorporate both of those. And then providing instruction in small groups, allowing for ample learning opportunities. Um, research has shown that students uh, with ASD and severe learning needs are going to need multiple learning opportunities um, as opposed to perhaps their typical peers. And social instruction and social skills are no different in, in nature. They should be um, throughout a routine and uh, provided for multiple uh, learning opportunities to practice and generalize throughout uh, the day and routines. So let's move on to social skills instruction. It, these two illustrations um, show two 
boys in the preschool reverse preschool class reverse mainstream classroom, excuse me. And they're talking about the placemat that is extremely motivating to that child. It has dinosaurs on it and that happens to be his favorite topic. So they are discussing about the dinosaurs and what the dinosaurs names are. Um, look at the proximity of the children, putting just the children close together. And we'll talk about all these um, simple strategies, but also evidence-based strategies that help to facilitate that social skills instruction within the preschool classroom. The next visual you'll see a photo of uh, are two groups, and it's a, it's a visual support actually, that shows two social skills group times within that preschool schedule. One is called Learning Lab and the other is Teamwork Time. And those are two groups, small groups, um, you'll see the children's names underneath, that are working on, uh, it may be turn-taking, games, um, and the learning lab usually is a group effort to come to a, an outcome. So a sustained group interaction in order to uh, produce a product together as a group. Why is social skill instruction important? Well, after looking at the criteria from DSM-5 and the Nas National Research Council, the ongoing theme or the ongoing point is that students with ASD and severe learning needs have deficits in communication and social abilities. Those go hand in hand. They are intertwined. When one has communication deficits, they're likely to have social skills deficits as well. So working on those together um, is important. Why else is it important? It's important because the set of skills in order to develop meaningful relationships and navigate through life uh, is a long goal, long-term goal for them, which would be adulthood. Uh, socially competent uh, people are more likely to be successful in establishing and maintaining relationships, as well as maintaining uh, employment, and so forth and so on. So it's important that both communication and social skills are worked on and addressed at, in the early years. Preschoolers need support to learn these skills in order to help promote that social competence. Uh, students, or children I should say, young children um, with ASD and severe learning needs are not inherently, are not necessarily going to pick up these skills inherently. Um, maybe as their typical peers. So those deficits need to be addressed and worked on um, throughout the daily schedule and in multiple settings. Um, they are not probably just going to have incidental learning um, take place that, that their typical peers would. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the social deficits. Social deficits for preschoolers, and this is not an exhaustive list, um, but in general, um, may include perspective taking, which has to do with theory of mind. So the, whole, the old adage of putting yourself in someone else's shoes or being empathetic or understanding someone else's perspective and reacting ac accordingly and appropriately um, may be a skill deficit especially, and, and again, we're keeping in mind that we have to realize what's developmentally appropriate. So always individualizing, always realizing um, developmentally what is appropriate at that age. Uh, sharing and taking turns, extremely important. Obviously, if you have deficits in this area, it's going to be difficult, especially when you're looking at least restrictive environment, placement for school age, and so forth. Um, as well as how you interact um, in different settings. Um, if you're not able to begin to take turns or, or share or wait, um, these can be skills that are going to impede um, your progress and, and, and perhaps um, slow down. They're going to impede your progress the progress of the child and possibly um, inhibit 
social interactions that can take place. Um, and we're talking about meaningful and purposeful interactions. Um, preschoolers don't always come with how do I understand the emotions that are taking place? And this is typical of all young children, but especially probably um, children, young children um, with ASD and severe learning needs. Um, the ability to recognize what is this emotion I'm feeling, able to label that, and then what are some appropriate actions or ways that I can regulate that behavior acceptable, socially acceptable ways or more socially acceptable ways that I can uh, label that behavior and then uh, do something about it that's appropriate. Um, obviously a very important area as well. Unwritten rules and social rules. This is probably one of the trickiest, um, especially for young children, knowing um, what, what happens in certain situations, social situations, what I do at home versus what I do at school, what is uh, socially acceptable in a restaurant or what is socially acceptable on a playground or a park. Um, knowing those rules, that's, that's a difficult and complex um, skill and I would say that there are many socially um, competent preschoolers that are typical preschoolers that still um, may struggle with with knowing those unwritten rules or social rules. Nonverbal communication, um, that's the body language, the eye contact, gesturing, um, knowing facial features, what does that mean? Um, and reacting appropriately, oftentimes um, those are very ambiguous for students, especially uh, young children with ASD and severe learning needs. And then, um, Establishing friendships. Uh, those, the younger uh, years are where a lot of that begins to take place. Of how do I initiate? How do I uh, get to spend time with somebody that I find motivating or interesting or want to be around? Um, that is often a difficult area as well. So, we're going to talk a little bit more about social skills for preschoolers and break down um, some of those skills into definitions and go into more detail. So, social skills for preschoolers. In these pictures, um, you will see two very different interactions, but obviously social ones. Uh, the children are playing in the dram dramatic play center, and you will notice there are three students that appear to be closer in proximity um, and they are interacting, um, talking to each other about what they're doing um, and playing dress up and so forth and so on. And then the one young boy is on the ground and he is um, playing with a doll. And you'll see that he's a little bit um, out of the group there. So we'll talk about play and, and how there are different I'm not going to get into too much about the levels of play, um, but you can see how the interactions might be a little different just based on looking at that picture. And the next picture shows a circle time activity. And this young man has just recently been motivated by social relationships. So he's actually holding hands with a, a peer and wants to sit by her at circle time and so forth. So he's just now moving from that um, more socially aloof, I would say, um, to realizing that um, he is motivated and enjoys this, these social interactions. Building social skills for preschoolers. We're going to go through these um, and talk a little bit about how these are, um, how these relate to preschoolers. So social reciprocation. Social reciprocation would be that back and forth chain of interactions. And it, it involves a multitude of um, taking cues from another and realizing what those are and then interpreting them and then perhaps reacting back um, to the uh, person. They can be dyads, triads, so forth um, in nature.
but the main point is that they usually the social reciprocation is where each party is equally reinforced so uh, they're both motivated or reinforced by the outcomes of those interactions and then social conversation would be that communication or that communicative exchange um, again could be dyad triad in nature and it may include a multitude especially within an early childhood uh, classroom it may include a multitude or a variety of modes of communication and identifying and regulation of emotions uh, for preschoolers this involves them being aware of their different emotions labeling those emotions and then the re regulation what do I do about it labeling saying I'm mad and being able to understand that their emotions and their label are matching up uh, this is this is something typical of uh, a student that may say um, I'm happy today but they're exhibiting behaviors that would correlate more with uh, being angry or upset so being able to identify and we're talking basic emotions um, obviously with early um, early learners um, we're talking about just basic emotions not getting into the more complex and then group rules and expectations following those basic rules and building on those early social skills so how do we line up in the classroom do I have to raise my hand do I not um, what are your routines of the day and being able to complete those routines in a socially appropriate manner um, so it may be how do I get myself transition from point A to point B within the classroom without disruptive behaviors um, and again keeping in mind developmentally what's appropriate um, for children two-year-olds are probably not going to walk in a little straight line so we have to keep in mind um, again always keeping in mind that individual and, and, and individualizing and also what is developmentally appropriate and play and leisure um, there with play and leisure um, being able to find something to do when there's some downtime how do I occupy myself in socially appropriate or more socially appropriate manner I should say and uh, what does that involve and some of the students or children need to be learned need to learn prerequisite prerequisite skills um, if I don't have things such as joint attention or if I'm not at that level of play yet um, due to just developmentally um, then of course uh, they're not ready for that they're not ready for that next step so keeping that in mind and looking at what skills are involved um, not only in um, play but also um, activities what skills are going to be involved in that activity so what is it going to look like when children are out on the playground um, what are some of the activities that student can participate in that are going to be developmentally appropriate and what skills what what missing what skills are missing there that they might need to be taught so on to the good part of how to embed the social skills instruction throughout the curriculum um, this is just the basics and we're going to get into this a little bit more um, but one of the most probably the most important proactive measures would be your environmental environmental arrangements and structuring the environment another would be planning for for social skills instruction within the daily schedule across settings and people so if this isn't a one-time shot of we have 30 minutes where we're going to work on social skills and I'm going to teach you how to move from parallel play or from um, joint attention to um, all of a sudden a sustained interaction with a peer okay um, this is throughout the daily routine in a natural uh, environment as a part of the daily schedule um, and then embedding some the partner play or peer buddies and peer mediation whenever possible um, oftentimes uh, kids are going to learn from each other uh, because they're highly motivated by that um, and they can be role models um, for the here and now of what's taking place um, for those preschoolers and, and then using the natural environment such as the playground and center time so using those 
uh, natural opportunities to embed social skills instruction in a systematic way, but embedding that um, within that natural occurring environment where it's going to happen and take place. So now we're going to talk more about explicit social skills instruction. Systematically teaching social skills. Again, I mentioned that students aren't necessarily going to incidentally learn these skills um, as they grow and develop. So being having a plan in place, being proactive of how you're going to systematically teach those social skills within your pre, the preschool environment. It, this can be adult or peer mediated, um, hopefully a mixture of both really. Um, as, we, uh, as I mentioned, kids may learn more from their peers as role models. Um, they're mo highly motivated by their peers. Um, it's the here and now and where they want to be. So sometimes, um, whenever possible, using that peer mediation, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the um, latter part of this webcast. Um, it may be based on per a particular curriculum. So there are many social curriculums. Um, there are many resources available. Um, or it may not. It may be um, that you're embedding different parts of a curriculum. Um, it may be that um, you are um, not making your own up. I don't want to say that, but it may be that you're embedding um, various parts of a particular curriculum, and there are many out there. It should include evidence-based practices. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, based on research, um, evidence-based practices are um, are effective in the um, treatment models of, for students with for children with ASD and severe learning needs. Um, so we need to teach them in the way that they learn, so to speak. Uh, providing opportunities to generalize with peers. Um, this is important. So again, just having a thirty minute session, a dyad of a, of the teacher and uh, the uh, child is probably not going to be enough. They need ongoing and um, several learning opportunities and need to be able to practice those skills, so to speak, um, with peers and families. Um, and then you're going to embed those within the routines throughout the day. So the more, there are several routines usually in um, a preschool, and the more that you can embed those into those naturally occurring routines, um, hopefully the more successful um, the skills instruction is going to be. Naturalistic based instruction of social skills. Uh, this involves use, using that, again, that natural environment. Um, pro, promoting social development by using the environment um, is generally more motivating, um, does not take the child out of what they're doing, so to speak, to work on in an isolated manner. Um, and it's where the child wants to be and doing what they want to be doing. So if it's um, play, um, then if they're in a play center, using those opportunities in that area um, to work on um, those natural occurring or natural contingencies. So for example, I have on there that a child wants to get a toy and the child initiates by saying, car please. And then the ch child receives the car and it gets to roll it back and forth and this is motivating. So it is both motivating and reinforcing um, and building upon those natural contingencies in, a, in the natural environment um, is uh, going to probably promote more social interactions and then um, less likely for the child to avoid or have interfering behaviors if they are where they want to be doing what they want to be doing. In this video you will see uh, a typical, this is a reverse mainstream preschool classroom and you will notice um, how um, within the natural environment, this will be uh, taking place at center time, um, and noticing how the teacher um, 
the prompting that she uses, the facilitation that's going on, um, but it's occurring within that natural environment. And a natural part of the routine of this classroom um, is uh, center time play. And this is in the block area. They are, um, I believe the theme for the week is, uh, is all about zoo animals. And so they are, um, they are interacting together um, with blocks and stuffed animals. Hi there. Cut some strips on the cut the strip however you want. You got your dog. 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 You
Let's start with our talk about antecedent-based interventions. This, is, this involves what you do proactively ahead of time to promote those social interactions. So arranging the environment, um, this can be both your visual structure, um, visual boundaries. Um, does, does the student know what's going to take place within that particular context or that setting? So um, does it convey what is going to take place there? Um, and how do you do that? Do you provide visual supports? Who's going to be in charge of it? What are their materials? Um, and, and systematically planning that out ahead of time. Um, sometimes that can be the key to not only promoting social interactions, but also preventing unwanted or interfering behaviors. Um, just being proactive about how am I going to set up different areas of the room, who will be in charge. Um, and one of those things, uh, again, kind of sabotaging the environment sometimes. So maybe something is closed off that day and the student needs to come up to the adult or a peer and ask, you know, why, what center can we play and why is this closed and so forth and so on. Um, and um, also sometimes having the peer have that most exciting um, activity or item and um, that they are the facilitator and everyone has to go to that particular peer um, in order to access materials. So this is just a picture. Uh, it, obviously it shows a, it's a, a table that's extremely low to the ground um, and there's going to be an art activity that takes place. There are the cube chairs, there are boundaries. You can't see the boundaries as well, but um, so that there's at least going to be a dyad going on um, in this area and they know that it is going to be an art activity um, based on the materials that are supplied. But again, um, there's paper there, but maybe not the, not the crayons, maybe not the, um, the glue, so that they're going to have to work together to find these supplies. Visual supports. Um, visual supports, we all use visual supports. Um, visual supports are um, highly effective um, in social skills training as well as many other um, many other reasons or many other um, uh, capa not capabilities but many other um, reasons for using visual supports within an early childhood um, classroom not just for social skills but they can be used to help visually break down what is involved in the social skill that I am trying to that, that is being worked on or that you're trying to teach. Um, and it may be used, as, a lot of times we think of visual supports and breaking down skills and task analysis. We think of those for fine motor, gross motor, or self-help skills, but also um, highly effective um, for social skills as well. Um, it, it assists the child essentially give them cues at times if necessary. There are many different types of visual supports and I won't go into all of them, but um, many different types of visual supports that can be used um, in order to help facilitate social skills instruction. Um, it must be on the child's level of understanding this is extremely important. So we're thinking preschool, right? So it might not be this exhaustive um, written out list. It's probably going to be objects maybe color photographs, um, and using true picture, true photographs versus icons. So again, individualizing, always individualizing. Um, I know I've said that quite a bit. Um, the visuals that you'll see here, um, one is simply um, the variety of materials that were in the Dramatic Play Center for that um, particular week. And so a young student who um, was on a picture exchange communication system was able to go up and these were placed strategically near that area in order for him to go into the air, the boundaries of the, air, the play area and um, request or um, request or talk about the different um, things to play with in the Dramatic Play Center. Um, the next is a very, very common 
uh, visual, which is a visual schedule of what's going to take place. And this is a classroom schedule. Um, obviously, um, this is for the whole group, but there are many schedules that should be individualized and portable for students. Um, and including that social skills time, if it's greeting, um, you know, having maybe a visual icon for we're, we come into the classroom and you know we greet everybody and um, so again visual cues uh, for the student for those skills and then um, the students need to ha be, be taught how to use that visual support so we're not just laying these visuals next to the uh, young child and assuming that they're gonna oh this it must be time for this because I see this visual they have to be systematically taught you're obviously going to do some um, ongoing data um, and it will most likely involve prompting um, and reinforcement as well. Task analysis. So task analysis can also be um, extremely effective um, in social skills instruction by breaking down a skill into small teachable parts. Social skills and social interactions involve many different small pieces, so to speak. So when we talk about greetings and farewells and turn taking and waiting, um, what, what are the, the variety of steps that are going to take place from the beginning to the end of that um, skill? And being able to break that down so that um, it can be taught in a systematic way, but also visual supports can be added in. Um, and this many times it's misunderstood that social skills are a social activity. So an ac activity is different than the actual social skill. And breaking that down and finding out, oh, this is where the deficit lies, or this is where we need a, a prerequisite skill because we're not able to move on to having a full conversation if I'm not even able to give joint attention or um, things of that nature. The three-term contingency um, would involve um, antecedent response and consequence. So. Um, Many times it's referred to the ABC um, or um, the ARC, which is antecedent response and consequence. Um, the antecedent is the direction or cue given. So what takes place first? What's the stimulus or what's the behavior that takes place? And then there is a response, um, what the child does, what the child says, um, and then the consequence. So what happens after that, the child's behavior? Um, is it reinforcement or perhaps redirection and error correction? Um, incorporating this into social skills is extremely beneficial because, again, proactively setting up that antecedent um, or cue and knowing to have that antecedent or cue on the student's level um, is more likely to, if it's paired with reinforcement, is more likely to get the appropriate response or the uh, a response that is um, is requested or wanted. So with task analysis and the three-term contingency, often um, there it will be they will be paired with prompting. Some type of prompting is going on in order for that student to elicit the appropriate response and then be positively reinforced. So de determining what prompt um, will be used to ensure that the child is successful um, will be key, will be a key, um, key factor here. Um, and the hierarchy of prompts to be considered. So when I am going to be uh, presenting or working on this social skill, um, what level of prompt am I going to use first? Or, you know, have planned out, systematically planned out that I'm going to use this prompt and then the likelihood that that student will be errorless um, or successful. And then um, fading the prompts as soon as possible so that, again, this, the child does not become prompt dependent. Um, being able to do this on their own eventually without someone prompting or cueing. 
And it's important to know the roles of the adults or um, who are assigned to prompt and reinforce. So um, might not be like, or might not happen um, if, if I don't know that I'm in charge of that social interaction and what am I doing? So again, having this planned out um, is extremely important um, to be proactive in knowing the individual student, what motivates them, um, what, are you, what, is, what is going to reinforce them to want to work on this social skill anyways, um, and just making sure that that's done ahead of time. Reinforcement. Reinforcement is anything given, basically, that increases the likelihood that the behavior will reoccur. So uh, thinking of young children, this can be a variety of um, not only tangible things, but also social. It all depends on the individual, and it's important to do um, some type of reinforce, reinforcer assessment um, it can be formal or informal. Um, every you know every um, program is different, but doing a reinforcement assessment to really know is this motivating for the child? Um, because if if it is if it's not motivating to the child, and maybe you're only providing social reinforcement, and they're just not there, that that's just not motivating to them. Um, then it's probably unlikely that that social skills instruction will be effective um, or that that behavior will reoccur. So when the antecedent uh, is, um, it, when the antecedent takes place, that response may not match up or may not be um, the, um, the, I would say the appropriate, not the appropriate, but the, um, the chosen response that you would want because maybe the reinforcer is sort of a who cares. Um, and if that's, if that's the key, if, if that's the problem, then um, probably not going to be as effective in the social skills instruction that's going on. And then um, developing a schedule for re reinforcement. When are you going to reinforce? With what? Um, obviously, if it's a very difficult skill or a new skill, probably the rate of reinforcement or how often you're reinforcing um, might be a lot, um, be taking place more often than a child that has this, this is a skill that they've been working on for a long time and has um, been successful with the skill and now um, it, it's just more maintenance of the skill. You might not be reinforcing that as um, often. Peer mediation. Um, peer mediation um, involves training peers um, so that systematically training peers, I should say, so that they can initiate, gain attention, interact, and provide opportunities for social communication. They, peer mediation can take place for both pre-academic skills as well as communication and social, but for our purposes, we're just strictly talking about for social um, communication or social interactions. Um, it in increases the likelihood of social act interactions with preschoolers um, because again uh, the, that is what children they're running around they're playing they're part of that natural environment so the peers are motivating they're doing uh, things that maybe um, other young children are wanting to do so therefore they're motivated by these interactions and they seem more natural um, than perhaps um, an adult and a ch young child working on some sort of uh, play or social interaction. Not to say that shouldn't take place as well, but whenever possible, using those uh, peers is extremely powerful. Um, consider your classroom arrangement and schedule the peer mediation, so to speak, as a part of the daily activities. Um, thinking about developmentally based programs, um, center times, Small group instruction is, is probably likely to be going on, and then um, natural occurring routines. So thinking of where can I sometimes, instead of putting the adult as the facilitator or the adult as the play peer buddy, um, when can I do this? And again, individualizing um, based on 
um, the student's skill level and need. Um, but it's certainly a powerful, um, powerful practice. In this video, you will see um, uh, during a typical snack time, um, during, the, during the course of the, the snack period, um, this teacher is working on a peer requesting, a, a young boy requesting from his peers. So instead of him only going to the adult, which is what he typically would do, and not really um, recognizing that the peers, that he can interact with the peers um, as he does um, with the adults. So trying to fade the adult out, um, you'll see that she um, is helping to facilitate that. But the peers in this classroom, um, they are um, systematically taught and each one knows when it's their turn to be that peer mediator uh, for this young boy to request. And it's extremely powerful um, when you watch that interaction taking place, especially when um, he was unable uh, to even request, let alone request with a peer. You want me to help you? Can I get this on now? No. Can I get this thing on now? No. No. Uh oh. No. Uh oh. No. 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 Okay, so did you notice how he was given multiple learning opportunities within just that one natural setting, that natural um, routine of snack and what do we do during snack? Um, he was given quite a few opportunities to interact with peers. The way he's placed all around peers, the adult, again, tries to um, not be so close, the proximity. Um, she does prompt a few times, but is trying to let the peers um, conduct or facilitate the interaction with him requesting. So, to summarize, um, there are a variety of methods to use uh, with preschoolers um, with regards to social skills instruction. And it's important to layer in both systematic and natural-based instruction. So systematically teaching, but in a natural environment that with typical pe with the peers and with also um, the natural routines that are taking place within an early childhood program. Um, being proactive, setting up that environment to allow for those social opportunities. How it takes place so often that we're so used to being the adult and the teacher that sometimes we are actually impeding those natural social opportunities that could be taking place. Um, just as the video showed, the teacher didn't realize, hey, he can go to his peers. And that's already, that's we're working on a multitude of skills here. He's working on requesting but he's also working on so many uh, social skills within just that snack period. So again, setting up the environment to allow for those social opportunities, um, the arrangement of the classroom, the visual supports that are there, does that, does that area convey what's going to take place? 
um, in that area. Um, using evidence-based practices when implementing social skills, again, um, teaching children in the way that they need to be taught, uh, essentially incorporating, layering those in, um, and doing ongoing evaluations throughout of um, individual goals, but also the practices being used. And of course, uh, it, it must be part of the daily schedule and provide multiple opportunities. So this can't be the 30 minutes of um, intense social instruction and then we're not really working on it the rest of the day, um, especially for young uh, young children, early learners. They're going to need a multiple um, opportunities uh, to be able to generalize across settings um, and people. And then always including um, the families and other settings whenever possible to help promote the acquisition and generalization of these skills so that, again, they are able to practice those in a variety of settings um, and with a, a variety of people. Um, and all of this is to say that hopefully by embedding uh, evidence-based practices and incorporating systematic and natural-based instruction um, that you're well on the way to making more socially competent children. And, but keeping it fun all at the same time. I really should add that, you know, it is preschool and you're, it's supposed to be playful and um, engaging and motivating. So keeping in mind how you can layer in all of these uh, things into the preschool programming um, without losing sight of it is developmentally appropriate to be playful and fun at that age. Um, a couple of resources um, that of course may be helpful would be the um, would be the Virginia Commonwealth University um, Autism for Cent Center for Excellence website, um, as well as the National Pro Professional Center, um, the NPDC, excuse me, National Professional Development Center um, on ASD. Uh, a variety of resources there as well. Um, both websites um, have several resources about um, all of the topics that we've discussed today.